uh, in, agree, in, uh, in collaboration with, uh, with uh, Luca Merlo, which is uh, right now in Madrid. Okay, so uh, to begin, this is next. Uh, to begin, I will begin with a very uh, broad uh, introduction. So just before the talk, I had to put several slides together because there is a maximal uh, size allowed actually for the slide. So now I have also some some yellow spots on the slide. <laughs> I don't know it happened. Um, so just a general introduction about dark matter. We have um, uh, actually several sources of information that tell us uh, that uh, our universe uh, today is actually uh, made of uh, several components, not only uh, standard matter or bionic matter, which interact with light. The first hints for dark matter came from uh, uh, studying the dynamics of galaxies in galaxy clusters, or also uh, later on uh, ro rotation curves of galaxy, which are uh, the rotation velocity of the stars as a function of the distance from the center of galaxy. And from, I mean, from these analyses, um, people already uh, begin to uh, propose the fact that uh, the galaxy is surrounded by a halo of dark matter, which interacts less with light with than uh, standard bionic matter. Now, we have uh, several extra uh, sources of information, so several other uh, cosmological observations that support the fact that the universe is made of very few standard matter. We have large-scale structure in order to explain uh, the way they appear today. Uh, we need uh, clearly some other type of matter that interact uh, not much with with light and is going to be uh, able to uh, gravitationally, gra gravitationally collapse more easily than uh, the type of matter that is coupled with light. We have also uh, CMB anisotropies in order to explain the form of the peaks of the CMB. We also need uh, the presence of an extra matter component. And uh, to finish with, uh, the, uh, the, the latest uh, uh, cosmological uh, data uh, that give us, uh, let's say, information new component of the universe come from Supernovae 1A, where uh, that uh, put forward the fact that the universe is today in a period of ex accelerated expansion. And uh, in order to explain that, we need another component, which is not, uh, doesn't act as matter for gravitational collapse and so on but uh, which actually going to lead uh, this, um, this accelerated expansion. So um, putting together uh, data with, of, uh, of a baryonic acoustic oscillation in, uh, in a large scale structure, uh, CMB and, uh, and supernovae data, we get uh, to a concordance model uh, in which uh, we actually have uh, something like 70% of uh, the matter energy content of the universe, which is made of uh, dark energy, I mean, here in the form of a cosmological constant, and something like 30% of matter. This 30% of matter con con is constituted of uh, not only ordinary matter, so, I mean, actually looking at the latest CMB data from Planck, I mean, this is the latest picture we have of uh, the acoustic peaks. Uh, we have now the idea that ordinary matter is only, uh, can only account for 5% of the total uh, matter energy content of the universe, and uh, that uh, dark matter is uh, something like 27% of the total uh, matter energy content of the universe. For the rest, we are left with 68% for uh, dark energy. So this is just a very broad uh, uh, and, I mean, something that you probably uh, all know, uh, introduction. So now let's uh, go to the, to the subject of, uh, of this talk, which is to, to look at some candidates uh, for uh, dark matter. In particular, I will uh, consider Higgs portal dark matter scenarios. And um, I will uh, look at the possibility uh, to have some connection between uh, dark matter and uh, minimal flavor violation hypothesis and the consequence for uh, dark matter phenomenology. Okay, so 
First of all, what is Higgs portal or SMS portal for standard model scalar uh, portal? Typically, the idea is um, that uh, interaction uh, between dark matter and visible, invisible matter could be uh, driven by the exchange of, uh, of Higgs or standard model scalar. Uh, more formally, typically this corresponds to introduce uh, in your Lagrangian an interaction between uh, the operator H uh, dagger H, where H is uh, the, the Higgs doublet, with some combined with some uh, dark sector operator. So this is a very old idea that dates back to the uh, the 90s. I mean, you cannot see the list of authors there, but okay. Um, then uh, within this uh, this uh, Higgs portal scenario, uh, a simple dark matter candidate is the case of a scalar singlet of uh, the standard model, which is going to uh, to to couple to the Higgs portal through um, the, the, the interaction lambda s, s square is dagger h that you see there. So uh, this is uh, a renormalizable interaction, which is the interest of a scalar singlet dark matter compared to a fermionic uh, singlet dark matter. And uh, the coupling lambda s is uh, adimensional. And in order to uh, guarantee the stability of dark matter, uh, we are going to assume typically that there is a Z2 symmetry under which uh, the uh, scalar is, I mean, the, the, the scalar singlet is odd and all the other uh, components of the standard model are even. Okay, so now, in order to, I mean, now what, I mean, what we can see is that typically uh, the interaction uh, of the Higgs portal is going to drive uh, all annihilation processes, so dark matter annihilating into fermions or a gauge boson through the exchange of, uh, of a Higgs, and uh, scattering uh, on nucleons, so dark matter scattering on nucleons through the exchange of a Higgs also. Uh, annihilation is important for uh, relic abundance of dark matter, but also for indirect detection searches today, and uh, scattering on nucleons is important for direct detection searches. They are both driven by this uh, lambda s uh, coupling for uh, dark matter uh, interaction through its portal. Okay, so this is a very simple scenario. Now the question that uh, uh, many people have asked is, um, do we have to impose this Z2 symmetry by hand, or uh, can we uh, get it from uh, another symmetry, another larger symmetry? And uh, this is a question that uh, Battelle and collaborator, so this is the paper which is uh, referred to uh, there, Battelle, Pradler, and Spakovsky uh, in 2011, uh, propose to guarantee, to try to guarantee uh, the, the stability of dark matter, so not allow dark matter to decay directly into standard model particle, uh, within uh, the minimal favor violation hypothesis. Okay, so, okay. So, minimal, I mean, to be very brief, minimal favor violation hypothesis uh, was initially motivated to suppress uh, large uh, flavor violating processes in new physics scenarios. Uh, typically, it's going to assume that uh, the global flavor symmetry that appear in the kinetic term of uh, the standard model Lagrangian is only going to be broken by Yukawa matrices that are promoted to be auxiliary fields. And uh, the idea of uh, battle and collaborator is to assume that uh, dark matter is actually charged under uh, the, the flavor symmetry group and that you are going to pick uh, a representation of the symmetry group so that dark matter uh, is not allowed to decay into a standard model particles. So to be, I mean, to uh, go a bit more in detail into this uh, this uh, this uh, reference, this paper, so they focused on the quark sector and uh, which presents a certain global flavor symmetry, 
the quarks, so the, the doublet of SU2 Q left and the singlet of SU2 U right and D right transformed under this uh, flavor symmetry group as triplets, each one under one of the SU3. And uh, the, the Yukawas uh, also, I mean, the, the Yukawa matrices also have to transform under this, uh, this, uh, this symmetry group as uh, in the way you see there. So for Yukawa up as 3, 3 bar 1, and for the Yukawa down, you have 3, 1, 3 bar. And this you need in order to, be, uh, to ensure the invariance of uh, the Yukawa Lagrangian under the flavor symmetry group. Now, for what concerns dark matter, um, assuming that this dark matter is charged under, this, uh, under the flavor symmetry group, you are going to be able to write some decay operator of uh, dark matter into a certain number of u left, u right, d right, and uh, you will need some insertions, insertions of uh, um, Yukawa matrices in order to have, uh, I mean, to be able to, to write this uh, decay operator. So now you are going to assume that, for example, uh, the, the representation under uh, the flavor symmetry group of your dark matter is, is, uh, is fixed as, uh, as, as it is written there, so which it's with a certain, I mean, your, your dark matter has a certain representation, and this number N, M, uh, NQ, MQ for the SU3Q left, and U, MU for SU3, SU3U right, and then D, M, D for SU3D, right? Sorry, I suppose that you cannot see it much. They are going to take values between Z, I mean, for zero if it's a singlet, one if it's a triplet, and so on. And actually, so uh, Battel and collaborator got to the conclusion that they can actually forbid uh, any decay operator and so grant the stability of uh, the dark matter multiplet if these uh, this combination of n, so nq plus nu plus nd for n, and m equal mq plus mu plus md is equal is actually different from zero modulo three. So this is the conclusion they get, and they uh, they um, they had some table where you can actually see, uh, li I mean, a list of uh, different represent possible representation. Uh, lowest dimensional representation under the, the, the flavor symmetry group, uh, which can be uh, singlets completely, but this is not stable. Or for example, triplets under one, one of the SU3, which is actually stable, or I mean, some other combination and uh, see which one are going to be possibly a stable dark matter candidate or not. Okay, so that was uh, for the uh, stability uh, of dark matter within minimal flavor uh, hypothesis. And uh, we uh, have actually considered uh, one possible representation that was uh, proposed by this author, which is actually uh, considered a scalar dark matter candidate, which is a singlet under the standard model, but, but a triplet under one of these SU3 of uh, the flavor symmetry group. So, Given that we have a triplet, we have three components, three possible dark matter candidates. And uh, this is, in any cases, a scalar that you can uh, still uh, couple to the Higgs portal. So you have, in any cases, the presence of um, Yukawa, I mean, not Yukawa, sorry, Higgs portal interaction. So the first term for the potential that is written there is just a bare mass term for the S, then you have a pos uh, the, the introduction of, of this uh, Higgs portal interaction, which is going to contribute in the second line to uh, the, the mass of the dark matter candidate, but which is also going uh, to, uh, to fix the uh, dark matter uh, Higgs interaction. So this is for uh, the Higgs portal part. Uh, for this uh, dark matter candidate. Now, uh, given the, 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 
the representation of uh, this uh, this uh, dark matter uh, candidate under the, the flavor symmetry group, um, you are in, in within the, this minimal flavor um, uh, hypothesis. You you can also actually uh, look at other possible uh, interactions between uh, the dark matter and the standard model. You can actually write uh, some extra possible uh, interaction which are suppressed by some um, scale of new physics, lambda dark matter square. Uh, and uh, you will be allowed, for example, to write uh, interaction of the vector type, which uh, some insertion of the gamma mu uh, for the quarks and the derivative uh, for, for, the, for, for the scalar part, or scalar type interaction, which just do not have any uh, um, introduction of gamma mu for the quark part or derivative for the S, and uh, that we need uh, for uh, SU2 um, in order to power Lagrange to be invariant under SU2 half to introduce uh, a Higgs field there. Okay, so more in detail for uh, the dimension six operator that, are in that we are going to be considering in our analysis. Uh, for the vector type interactions, uh, we have been focusing on uh, this interaction with, um, with a do doublet uh, Q left. Actually, we could have exchanged this by uh, U right or D right. It doesn't change much for uh, the, the rest of the analysis. And uh, these are the typical uh, possible coefficients that uh, we have to introduce. So you see that uh, in the minimal case, you can uh, you can uh, you do not need any introduction of uh, Yukawa insertions, but uh, but you can I mean always in the in the in these uh, minimal uh, flavor symmetry context you can always look at what is going to be the impact of uh, extra insertion of Yukawa up Yukawa up dagger or Yukawa D Yukawa D dagger uh, and uh, so I mean this is what we have we have done so we have several. Uh, coefficients c1, c2, c3, c4, c5, which are which we have been taken to be of order one, and then we have been looking at uh, the the impact of these uh, different terms. For uh, the scalar type interactions, uh, you always need the introduction of at least uh, one uh, uh, Yukawa in order to have uh, invariance of your operator under uh, the flavor symmetry group. And again, we have been uh, in, we have been taken into account insertions uh, in, of uh, Yukawa, Yukawa up dagger up to, I mean, one insertion of this type. Okay. So something that I want uh, I wanted to highlight here is that actually some of these uh, these uh, these terms are going to uh, introduce uh, the possibility to have co-annihilation processes. Uh, through this, uh, this dimension six operator, which is the possibility to uh, make an interaction between uh, some one component of uh, the S triplet with another component of the S triplet, which will uh, annihilate, or better said, co-annihilate into a couple of, uh, of quarks. So this is something that we are going to, uh, to actually see that is going to change a bit the picture of uh, this, uh, this dark matter in the minimal flavor uh, context compared to uh, simple uh, Higgs portal scenarios. Okay, so now I want to discuss, uh, I mean, in general, the constraints you have on dark matter phenomenology. So typically, you have to take into account uh, the fact that you want to have the right relic abundance of dark matter. Uh, in our analysis, we have been considering the freeze-out mechanism, uh, which assumes that at the origin, the dark matter is in thermal equilibrium with uh, the, the, the standard model particle uh, through a certain, norm of, certain number of processes, uh, which can involve annihilation of a dark matter into standard model particles. And uh, the dark matter abundance is going to freeze out when um, the interaction rate of dark matter, which goes as the number density of dark matter times the annihilation 
uh, cross-section is of order of uh, the expansion rate. So that means that typically, if you have uh, a larger value of the annihilation cross-section, you are going to stay more time um, in, a, um, in a strong interaction with the thermal plasma. And if your particle is actually non-relativistic, as you can see in the, in the plot, uh, actually you are, going to have, you are going to stay with a smaller value of uh, the, the dark matter number density. Why actually in the plot is the number density of dark matter divided uh, by the entropy, which actually just, uh, it's, it's just something like the dark matter number density divided by T cube. And um, the, 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 the drop you see, it's, uh, it's Boltzmann suppression when the dark matter becomes non-relativistic. Okay, so now typically for uh, cold relics with, with a few GV mass, uh, it corresponds to ask in order to have a relic abundance of order of 27% uh, of 25% um, 27% of uh, the matter energy content uh, of the universe is to ask that the annihilation cross section of the of the dark matter is of order of 10 of 310 to the minus 26 centimeter cube per second and uh, when we we talk about this type of of annihilation cross section we refer to it as typically weakly interacting massive particle scenario because uh, these cross sections are of the order of a weak interaction for dark matter candidate which would be of order of uh, some hundreds of GeV or TV range. Okay, now the fact that the annihilation cross section uh, at the time of uh, decoupling of the dark matter was of order of 3 10 to the minus 26 centimeter cube per second doesn't imply uh, doesn't imply that uh, today in uh, the, the annihilation cross section that is going to be relevant for indirect detection searches, for example, is exactly of this value. It could be lower, uh, in particular, if uh, the annihilation cross section has a velocity dependence, but some other effects uh, can be uh, also important there. Uh, resonances are going to be important, co annihilation and uh, also annihilation into uh, forbidden channels. So resonance, so when you have two dark matter candidates that go through the, through that uh, annihilate through the exchange of a Higgs, if uh, the, the dark matter mass is about half of the mass of the Higgs, this process is, is quite enhanced. And so you will need uh, the, the, the coupling to the Higgs to be very small in order uh, to explain this. And the fact that in the early universe, uh, the velocity, the, the, uh, the energy of the particle is not exactly the same as uh, what it would be uh, today in, uh, in, a, in a low velocity uh, limit makes that you are going to, to have a, a suppression of uh, the annihilation cross-section that you have to look for. Uh, Co-annihilation process are, uh, so these processes of annihilation between two different uh, components of our S triplet, for example, in our case, uh, which have slightly different masses. And uh, actually, we assume that uh, the heavier component is going to uh, decay into uh, the, the, the lighter component. And we stay with the light component today. The heavier component is not there anymore and is not going to also uh, contribute to uh, uh, the, the indirect detection searches. Forbidden channel is also some, some, some other uh, possibility uh, in order to have no, uh, a smaller value of the annihilation cross section today. Okay, so for the constraints on annihilation of dark matter that we have been considering, so the constraint from indirect detection searches, uh, typically what you have is you have your two dark matter particles that can uh, annihilate and give rise to a certain uh, certain uh, final state that are going themselves to uh, through some some long chain go into photons neutrinos uh, positron or uh, um, antiprotons these uh, production of particles are constrained by several experiments we are uh, we have been considering uh, the constraint from fermilat uh, for uh, gamma rays uh, from dwarf ceridical galaxies. 
And we have also been considering uh, the constraint on the annihilation cross section uh, from a CMB observation. So when the dark matter, I mean, you had uh, a seminar, uh, a journal club recently on, 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 this, uh, on this subject from, by Aaron. Uh, so uh, dark matter mm, can, I mean, can, well, can annihilate also at the epoch of, of, um, of uh, emission of uh, the CMB. It's going to change uh, the, the, the situation, I mean, the, the recombination history, and it's, this can be actually detected uh, in the CMB anisotropy spectrum. At the end of the day, um, these are uh, the constraints uh, we have from I mean, several um, papers. So on the right hand side, you have the constraint from Fermilat for uh, uh, annihilation cross section on the y axis as a function of uh, the wind mass on the x axis. Uh, the, the line, uh, the, the, the horizontal line you see is actually an elation cross section type wind, so 3 10 to the minus 26 centimeter cube per second. And uh, the other lines you see, the dotted lines or continuous line that goes, that, that goes into this, uh, this horizontal uh, line are actually uh, the, the, the constraints you get from, uh, from uh, not op I mean, for not observing a specific signal from this, uh, for, from particle of uh, this annihilation cross section in this mass, uh, the actually the the continuous line you have is for annihilation into BB bar. Uh, for the left hand side plot, you have again annihilation cross section on the y axis as a function of uh, dark matter mass on the x axis. Um, the the brown line is, uh, is uh, again, the typical WIMP annihilation cross-section of 310 to the minus 26 centimeter cube per second. And uh, the gray region is actually the region that is excluded uh, by, um, by uh, uh, CMB observation, I mean, the combination of observations of the map plus PT, ACT, HST plus, uh, plus BAO. Uh, okay, and depending on the annihilation channels, you are going to uh, exclude actually uh, dark matter candidates, which are which have properties between uh, the the continuous black line and the, the the dotted black line. You have to trust me, but actually, typically, the these uh, this excluded region dig into the the wimp uh, wimp uh, uh, typical dark matter annihilation cross section. Uh, viable parameter space for masses around something like 10 or 20 GeV. So if you don't have a dark matter that is that has a ve velocity suppressed annihilation cross section or uh, doesn't go through co annihilation and so on, typically you are going to exclude uh, dark matter uh, wimp like dark matter uh, below 10 or 20 GeV. Okay. So. Uh, the constraints from direct detection searches. So here, what uh, people test is uh, so the scattering cross section of uh, dark matter on nucleons uh, in underground laboratories. There are several experiments in that game, and uh, the one which is uh, giving the strongest constraint in uh, the, the 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 GeV, I mean hundreds of GeV mass range right now is uh, the Xenon-Sans experiment. And in the low mass range, actually, below something like 10 GV, where you see that uh, the, actually the, the, the blue line, uh, which is the Xenon-Sans experiment, uh, everything that is above the, above the blue line is everything what, that is excluded by uh, Xenon-Sans experiment. Um, when you go on uh, at a low masses below something like uh, 10 GV in this plot, you see that the uh, Xenon-Sans experiment cannot uh, constrain any more dark matter models. And you can look at other um, experiments such as uh, Xenon-10, but also uh, Picasso, which is the one we are going to consider after. OK. Here you see that uh, the typical uh, scattering cross section that are excluded is something like 10 to the minus 44, 10 to the minus 45 centimeters square for a dark matter mass around something like 50 GV. Okay. So summarizing, 
the idea is that uh, in the annihilation cross section versus mass plane for a typical WIMP dark matter, which has a, some, something like a fit annihilation cross section, you are going to uh, typically uh, dig into the viable parameter space of WIMP with uh, direct uh, with indirect detection searches and CMB around something like 1020 GV. And you are going also to probe this uh, region in the GV range thanks to uh, direct detection searches. How does this translate in a particular model? So for example, in the case of uh, Higgs portal scenarios. So here, for a moment, I just forgot forget about uh, extra dimension six operator. I just look at uh, the, the Higgs portal interaction, which give rise to this lambda uh, HSS interaction. I get, OK, so again, you're going to have to trust me. But OK, you see the, 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 the diagrams uh, below the plots. So on the right hand side, you have um, annihilation cross sections as a function of the mass. And on the uh, left hand side, you have scattering cross section as a function of the mass of the dark matter. The, the green region that, uh, that appear now are the regions that are actually uh, allowed in order to get the right relic abundance in agreement uh, with, uh, for example, uh, Planck uh, observation. So a relic density of about uh, 0.1. Oh, sorry, of order of 25 percent, or omega h square of order of 0.1. Uh, what you see in the anil in the right hand side plot is that you typically need an annihilation cross section which is around 310 to the minus 26 centimeter cube per second, but you have some some wiggles uh, which typically appear around uh, half of the mass of the Higgs, so around 60 uh, 60, 60 GV. Uh, which correspond to this resonant annihilation of the Higgs. Then you have another uh, dip into this, uh, this, these horizontal lines that, uh, that comes from uh, the annihilation into uh, WW in the early universe. Okay, now this translates into the scattering cross section versus mass, which is the plot on uh, the, the, the left hand side as, a, as a, this, this green region where you again recover. Uh, this big dip, you, you see this big dip again, which corresponds to uh, the half of the mass of the Higgs approximately. It's the resonance into the Higgs particle that also appeared there. Okay, so now, uh, several constraints have to be put here. So first of all, now we have some, some, uh, some extra information on the, on the Higgs particle and uh, also on its decay, uh, possible decay into an invisible final state which uh, actually is going to typically exclude uh, dark matter particles below half of the mass of the Higgs, which have a non-negligible coupling uh, with the Higgs. In this case, we consider that everything of the dark matter ph phenomenology is actually driven by this coupling to the Higgs. So typically, you are going to exclude uh, low mass dark matter. And then you have also to superpose the constraints from uh, direct detection searches and indirect detection searches. So in the right hand, right hand side plot, you have um, a pink line that corresponds to CMB constraint, and you have a blue line that actually corresponds to a Fermilat constraint for annihilation to the BB bar, which is, uh, apart from CMB, one of uh, the most constraining uh, experiments in our case. Then on the left hand side plot, um, the pink line corresponds to a Xenon 100. Uh, experiment constraint, and you have on the upper uh, left part of the plot some black line that uh, that is actually a uh, uh, constraint from a Picasso experiment. The orange uh, line that you see a bit a, bit, a little bit lower is actually a future expectation for a xenon one ton experiment. So what you see right now is that actually the the viable part of uh, the parameter space for just Higgs portal scenario is actually uh, the blue points that are left there. So apart from the very fine-tuned uh, resonant region, what you get is that you should have uh, a dark matter candidate which has a mass above something like 100 GeV in order for your scalar dark matter candidate interacting through Higgs portal to be still viable today. Okay. Now. 
what is going to change if we introduce uh, extra possible interaction with some new physics, um, which uh, which is uh, which is uh, um, written in terms of effective operators, which are suppressed by some uh, lambda dark matter square uh, scale of uh, new physics. So remember, we said that we were going to consider some vector type interaction and scalar type interaction. Um, actually, you can process, you can calculate what could be uh, the typical annihilation cross-section. <laughs> so, okay, annihilation cross-section for this type of operator. They will have some dependence. They will go as a 1 over lambda for uh, dark matter. So they are suppressed by the, the, the scale of new physics. And uh, in the case of vector type interaction, it's actually they are going to be velocity suppressed. There is a v square on the uh, on the numerator, while you don't have ve velocity suppression in the in the case of scalar type interaction. Okay. So from I mean from a simple uh, rapid uh, looking at this this expression and putting a number inside, you can check that forgetting about uh, the I mean assuming that you can you can consider low coupling to the Higgs particle so that your, your uh, Higgs portal is not, uh, not having a lot, a lot of uh, contribution for getting the right relic abundance in the early universe, that everything is driven by, um, by the dimension 6 operator, you can, you can check that typically for a dark matter mass of order of 50 GeV, uh, you need a scale of new physics of order of 450 GeV for an operator of the vector type and uh, of order and a scale of new physics of order 200 GeV for an operator of uh, the scalar type. Okay, so now let's see how everything combined, but before that, just, I mean, let me remember that uh, we had a certain number of constraints up to now that we took into account. Um, on these type of uh, effective field theory, you can actually put some extra constraints from uh, collider physics, especially from um, uh, monojet uh, searches at colliders, but also uh, actually in this case we are going to have a constraint from uh, meson decays. So um, now I'm considering the combination um, Higgs portal uh, lambda HSS interaction plus the dimension 6 operator, either vector type or scalar type. And I'm going to look at the constraints we get in the uh, scale of new physics versus uh, dark matter mass plane, uh, which is the plane you, you should see there. So with the um, First, with uh, collider constraints, we get the uh, somewhat horizontal line uh, you see uh, appearing now. So actually, the, for, for vector type interaction with uh, scalar dark matter, so be careful that typically experiments are giving you uh, the constraint on the scale of new physics for fermionic dark matter, but they are not exactly the same for uh, scalar type dark matter. Here. Uh, the, 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 the black line corresponds to Tevatra constraint on the uh, scale of new physics, and the gray line corresponds to uh, uh, LHC reach, okay, from a Goodman, from the, from the paper of a Goodman collaborator. And uh, the gray band you see at the uh, low masses of the dark matter is actually the region that is uh, ruled out uh, due to uh, the constraints of uh, 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 meson decay into invisible uh, final states. Okay, so this is actually the new region that are excluded, that would be excluded, so region which is in the in the gray, uh, all the points that would appear in the, in, the, in the gray shaded region or that would appear below at least the black, uh, the black line should be excluded either by uh, monojet uh, searches at collider or by uh, meson decay into invisible final states. And this is where uh, the viable region for the combination Higgs portal plus dimension 6 operator appear in the case of vector type interaction. So actually, typically, 
remember the color of code we had before. Uh, the, the, the red point I excluded uh, by Higgs, uh, by, by constraints on the, on the, on the Higgs uh, annihilation to invisible finite states. The green points would be allowed, I mean, would give you the right relic abundance if we didn't have any constraint from uh, indirect detection searches and direct detection searches. And uh, the, the blue points are what are left. Now you see that Tevatron uh, constraint actually uh, completely uh, is completely uh, ruling out uh, the, the low dark matter uh, viable points, low dark matter mass viable points. This is actually the case for vector type interaction, but for scalar type interactions, uh, monojet searches constraints are a little bit lower and uh, you can actually still have um, viable dark matter candidates uh, in the low mass range. So you see that you have a small uh, possible region of uh, blue points in the, for a preferred coupling to U quark. So you have a Q left, U right, S star S H coupling, which typically goes, I mean, gives you a, the, an interaction which, which goes at the mass of the quark time U bar U time S dark S with a different possible U type quark. Uh, so this allows you to get this, this small, small region at, at very low masses here, about 1 GeV. In the case of uh, preferred interaction with a D type quark, so this time the Q right um, uh, in the scalar, scalar type interaction is a D right. And uh, you can, uh, the, the, the constraint from uh, meson decay goes a bit to larger masses because now you have constraint from B meson decay. And um, you still have, at the end of the day, small uh, new hilo, uh, small new island of uh, viable uh, dark matter candidates in the low mass range. So how is this possible? So what we know is that typically, what we have already seen is that typically uh, direct detection searches are going to be, uh, to be uh, very constraining, but up to uh, some, some, uh, some 4 or 5 GV mass range. Below it, it should be uh, any uh, constraint on, uh, from indirect detection searches that could uh, constrain the model. But here, actually, this, uh, this blue point in the low mass range, for example, in the case of a preferred coupling to the uptype quark, are actually driven by co-annihilation S1, S2 star through this dimension 6 operator um, into C bar U quark, while in the case of a preferred coupling for D type quark, the, the points in the low mass range are actually obtained. I mean, the relic abundance of these points actually obtained thanks to uh, co-annihilation uh, into uh, B bar D or B bar S uh, quarks. Uh, we also change a bit what is happening in the uh, large uh, dark matter mass range. And actually, for a preferred coupling to uptype quark, you are uh, going to uh, be able to evade uh, more easily uh, constraints from direct detection searches when your relic abundance is uh, driven by uh, this uh, effective uh, operator uh, going into a top top bar. So, I am now uh, getting to uh, my conclusion. We have been uh, looking at what could be the impact of, uh, of uh, embedding dark matter scenario within minimal flavor violation uh, framework, which was uh, uh, argued to be an interesting uh, framework for dark matter because uh, the dark matter stability is going to be uh, granted in this uh, minimal flavor uh, symmetry uh, hypothesis. Now, uh, what does this change us compared to, uh, to, the, to the simple case of a Higgs portal scenario? After applying uh, constraints from uh, direct detection searches, indirect detection searches, but also from flavor observable and collider searches, <coughs> is that we are actually going to have some um, viable dark matter 
uh, in the low mass range, which is going to uh, beyond the reach of uh, actual direct detection searches. Actually, um, future super CDMS uh, experiment is actually uh, now claimed to, uh, to, to be able to, uh, in the future, to, uh, to test this region. And uh, also what we have obtained is that uh, for uh, dark matter masses about something like the top mass, um, you going through these, uh, this effective operator of dimension six, we could also get uh, some new uh, region that could evade uh, constraint from uh, direct detection searches and indirect detection searches. So thank you very much for your attention. I am really sorry. Uh, for the difficulty to read the plots. Thank you, Laura. Is, yes. there, any, is there any questions? Are there any questions? Yeah, and Duran, maybe? He's against not everybody. Anybody? Yeah. Elisabetta? Elisabetta, you have a, if you have a question? Hi, I see you. Go ahead. I don't hear you. I think we have a voice problem, <laughs> essentially. You, you hear something? I am sorry, I don't hear anything. Ah. Maybe you can type. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I have heard some beep. Can you talk? <laughs> I don't hear you. No, no. Uh, yes, no. I yeah, I can yeah. It's amazing that you can do this for the number at one hundred percent. Only one mass. Huh? So. So which one? I mean, do you have several candidates of the same mass? I mean, S one, S two, S three. Are they all the same mass or? No, no. They are not all the same mass. So typically, there is a splitting between the 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 dark matter. Uh, the, the dark matter candidate, okay, which is uh, actually somehow a bit, uh, so it's, it's, it's a bit, the, the most natural thing, so if I can, I don't know if you can see the slide, uh, so typically you are going to have a mass difference between them, and what you expect is typically to have a rather strong, um, a rather strong, uh, um, Degeneracy between S1 and S2, okay, but uh, but S3 could be uh, higher masses, higher mass or lower mass. So so S3 can decay into S1 and S2. Can S2 yeah, but it could be the contrary also. 
Yeah, it can be the contrary also. We have considered all the possibility. Actually, in the plot, if you could see them, there are different points for the cases where S3 is uh, the lowest, um, the, the, the lowest uh, dark matter candidate of, uh, of, of the multiplet, or if S1, S2 are the lowest candidate of uh, the multiplet. I mean, your constraint are probably bar, but the annihilation can be different channel and mix among them. So yes, I totally agree. So I have only cons I, I have considered uh, the constraint for uh, for BB bar, but I also looked at uh, at the constraint on WW. And uh, I mean, in particular, in the case of uh, CMB constraint, you have a very tiny band on annihilation constriction for I mean, masses smaller than 10 GB or so. For the I mean, you you have not much difference. Uh, on the on the type of uh, of uh, final state you are producing the in the annihilation. So I mean this 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 should be uh, this should be okay, right? Okay. okay. Other questions? So maybe, so if there is nobody else, I would just ask one question. Yeah. Can you imagine a scenario which is similar to excited dark matter? Because you have this S1 and S2 with a very small... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time. Could you imagine this? Or? So... Uh, so you mean, I mean... I, I mean, I didn't look into that, but it should, I mean, it should, it should be totally possible because, I mean, you can, I mean, typically at least between S1 and S2, you can have a very small, uh, a, a very small mass difference, which is, uh, which is, which is fixed by the, the, the up, the Yukawa up, cop, uh, Yukawa up, um, uh, and Yukawa, y Yukawa C, uh, coupling, actually. I mean, if you look at the, the, so, I mean, yeah. But I didn't go uh, much uh, into uh, trying to take benefit from that. So the typical mass difference that you expect, I mean, maybe you mentioned it, but uh, uh, between these two guys? Yeah. It's very small mass difference. So, I mean, let me just find the, the slide. So, yeah, it's this. So, yeah. So you see, it's it's in the in in this uh, in this slide. You have uh, you see that everything is fixed by the Yukawa. So it's uh, mm -hmm. you, you you just you, the Yukawa squared. So it's very small mass differences between the S1 and S2. So I cannot tell you in GB right now. Sorry. Uh, I. I mean, I can I do I do not remember exactly what was the, the, the in term of GeV, but it's very small. I think I remember some factor of ten to the minus five. So it depends on the on the on the yeah, the, on the mass the, you are looking okay. at. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Nobody in the room. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. okay. So in this case, thank you, Laura, very much, and uh, we're going to close the session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.